I'm always on the lookout for games that are eccentric and unique. A game that goes beyond the mainstream and tries to offer something new. Something extreme and something different. This game is exactly that as a faithful representation of the legendary art of H.R. Geiger. For those that aren't aware, his art has influenced a lot of horror artists in a similar way that Stephen King did for the psychological horror. There's something about the way he mixes the living, the organic, the soul with the machine, the cold, the sublime, which creates a perverted reality so unimaginably dark that it transmits this feeling of suffering and decay like no other known artist. The melancholy of his art also stems from the pervertedness and explicit depictions of the human body and their sexual orgies. To be more precise, he's less interested in glorifying or depicting it in any other way than what it actually is. An intertwined process of fluids and physical masses that orgy together in order to create something relatable and yet so unpleasant, maybe even a little bit taboo. We as a society aren't encouraged to consider it as such, so his art is only appreciated by the most curious and open-minded individuals, which is also true for this game. There's a lot happening here to the point that, for someone that isn't as versed, can be pretty traumatizing. This isn't made for most people, and I think that's actually fine. In a way, this game reminds me a lot of another game called Agony. That studio thought that the concept of hell gets depicted in a way which aren't representative of the real thing. It's often a diluted landscape of blood, censorship, and a minimum of shock factor, therefore creating a PG-13 version of what should actually be a blasphemous realm of fluids, gore, sex, and apocalyptic destruction. They decided to make a statement by making a game that was so gruesome and sexualized that it was forced to adopt the adult rating, which is a statement to their vision. In case you weren't aware, that rating is practically never used as 99% of mature games end up, well, with the mature rating. So it takes a pretty unique breed to get there. The game didn't get it in the end, but that's a whole separate video for which I'll get to in the future. What's important here is that Agony was also marked as an adrenaline-packed experience with some combat mechanics which end up being the worst part of the game. It's a passion project about a handful of devs that decided that their first game was going to make headwaves, and it fucking did. Scorn is pretty much the same in this regard, as the trailers were sent to the wrong combat and graphics. Almost nothing was known about it, and the gameplay reveal was so different in tone to the trailers that you could have accused them of false marketing. I honestly didn't know what to think, but as I saw the similarities between both games, I decided to do the next best thing, which was to invite a few friends over and experience it for what it is and I'm so happy that it did because honestly it ended up being a more polished agony. Everything except the graphics are pretty polarizing as is convoluted puzzles, lack of storytelling, annoying combat and even more frustrating navigation and so much more. It's honestly pretty bad in everything else that it tries to do but for most games I would just cut it right there and spend a few hours trying to explain to you why it is but I can't really do that here as I'm left with paradoxical thoughts like what if it was made that way intentionally? You know, like, what if the bad combat was not made to be felt that way, but seen as another puzzle to solve? What if the lack of direction and storytelling was made so as to disorientate the player and to get him lost into this world? To drive that sense of apocalyptic dread, which engloves everything around you? To contradict it immediately by blowing you with its visual ecstasy? I find it really hard to piece my ideas together as this game is something that almost no others have tried to pull off. It's a performance in video game form and it plays out like a theatrical theater that puts you in front and center of the action. It wants you to feel the world and make you believe that it's part of you as much as you are of it. To feel the suffering portrayed and in return make you suffer through it and somehow learn to enjoy it. With all that in mind, this is another episode of my Dissecting the Walk series where I make a full walkthrough critique of the game with the goal of explaining what the game is, what works and doesn't, and the end goal being, is Scorn even worth experiencing? Hi, welcome to Gaming with Yovi. welcome to Scorn. Scorn is the passion project of the newly formed company called EBB Games. It's a small Serbian company who intended on making headwaves by making Scorn their first video game. They started working on it in 2014 and then created a Kickstarter project which failed from the lack of support and marketing. When it all seemed lost, they found an investor who funded them with a big enough cash flow to allow them to refine the project before making another Kickstarter project. Their plan was to make a two-part project as they were afraid that they would lack funds during its development. They 
therefore decided to release the first half of the game and then use the profits to fund the second part. That project ended up being successful, so they started working on the game rigorously. They promised that the game would release in 2018, but pushed it back as they felt that the game wasn't ready. In the meantime, they were also able to secure outside funding, which allowed them to scrap their two-part project and make a one complete package. After that, honestly not much was actually heard from the game. There were a few interviews, but nothing more, so some backers thought it was all a complex scam. There was also a general message that they posted which rubbed the people the wrong way as the tone was perceived arrogant, so naturally, the fans were outraged. Their answer to all these claims was that creating a quality product takes time and that anyone unsatisfied may request a full refund. They mostly went radio silent from there while resurfacing every few months to share their progress. Fast forward to about a month ago and the hype train actually started kicking in. Multiple teaser trailers were published and the beginning of the game was released. Interestingly enough, we still had no idea what the game was actually about. If you read the interview made by Gaming Bolt, you would know that it was actually intentional. They wanted the fans to go in without any expectations and that, ironically, ended up creating the opposite effect. Huh? Some people thought it was a first person shooter, others thought it was a glorified tech demo showcasing the graphics and me, personally. I expected it to be like Agony, a glorified walking simulator with puzzles and I knew right away that I was right, for better or for worse. Huh? Scorn starts you off with a cutscene of your character waking up after a long slumber. He has visions of a dead dusty wastelands, which lead him to fall into what seems like an endless pet. Huh? He gets up and our journey begins with no tutorial or dialogue to speak of. Our first reaction resembles the one of a young kid walking into Disneyland for the first time. Those claustrophobic corridors made of flesh, steel and bones really create a sense of awe like no other. Walls being made of bones and flesh fused together with some alien technology really brings you out of this world and immediately grabs your attention. Pipes are coming out of the ceiling, which seems to be made with organic tissues resembling an umbilical cord. Everything around the room reminds us of ourselves, and yet, it's presented in a way that makes us repulse from its lack of organic life. It's hard to figure out where one part starts and where the other one ends, and that's actually one of the greatest strengths on display here. The view is just beautiful. The natural light fading from above, acting like some fog glooms the air in a way that is reminiscent of other horror titles like Silent Hill. It creates an intrigue and atmosphere simultaneously while embellishing the global presentation in a way that isn't seen even in most AAA games. To top it all off, the void of sound being disturbed by your footsteps confirms the feeling of loneliness and despair. We're the only ones that have entered these halls in a very long time, making it impossible to not wonder why that is. Lastly, the way it stands out makes us instinctively know that getting there is our next objective. We walk towards the exit only to find what looks like a pipe sticking out of the wall. We interact with it and the machine traps us until it lets go revealing the fusion of man and machine which acts as the key is permanently screwed into our arm with the cost of blood being its currency. We use our newly acquired tool to open the door and head towards the tower. We get to the top and interact with the control pad which fits so well with the aesthetic that I'm honestly at a loss of words. I mean just look at it. The switches end up being the controls to the rail line and we're naturally introduced to our first puzzle. We enter the other pathways and find a machine that can scoop stuff. There's also a similar machine that has a saw attached to it. We need to add something into those, but what? We don't really know. We find the left and go to the second floor, and this is where the first frustrating part of the game shows up. We need to bring the egg-shaped container with the small light to the left end of the path in order for the claw to pick it up. The first egg is easily to bring, but ends up breaking into pieces when the claw picks it up. We then have to bring the second egg to the far end, but this time, it has another egg attached to its bottom. We then need to Tetris our way out, and the puzzle honestly took longer than I would like to admit. All spaces need to be accounted for in order to bring it to its destination. It can also only go on the connectors with the holes at its center, so it became frustrating pretty fast. Huh? But thankfully, there's no time limit and you can try as long as you need until you jailbreak it and succeed. We bring it down and place it on what looks like a toilet shaped chair and I mean I'm not kidding, look at it, it totally looks like a toilet right? That has to be like the coolest toilet I've ever seen. Okay, maybe the second one because the Sega urinals are actually pretty cool but certainly don't look as dope as these do. We get closer and examine what's inside and... 
I don't really know how to react. I mean, it looks so in pain, crooked and deformed, but it has a form of cuteness that I can't really explain. It looks at us with eyes of despair which say more than words can. We interact sympathetically towards it and instinctively want to help it, but we still don't know why it's here or what its purpose is. We push it for a while until our progress is halted by something on the path. We interact with the nearest console and my heart just tightens as the machine drops on it. <laughs> The sound it does goes straight for our soul. It hurts more when we get closer to it and it starts freaking out in pain. It grips the handle and shakes it in despair, but there's nothing that we can do but push onwards and hope that it gets better. We clench when we realize what's at the other end of the path. The chair with the saw. Thinking that we'll have to do the both chairs, we hesitantly activate the machine and move it onto the butchering table. We activate the final machine and try to keep our eyes open as it gets cut into pulp. We help it out by removing the shell, and look at it in awe as it tries to get up, huh? It takes a solid minute or two for it to come up, and it's impossible for me not to find it charming. The way it stumbles like a drunkard, combined with the way it looks at us, makes it impossible for me not to find it endearing. It even starts following me like it wants to thank us for saving it. We walk to the main door and try to get it open, but it doesn't work. We can also determine that we're going to need his help, as there are two consoles so two people are needed to open it. We try to bring it to the other side, into the second path, but he refuses to follow. Clearly, it's stuck there with a purpose, so we start looking for a way to get the door open. I try one switch and it doesn't work, and try the second one and same issue. We look at the thing, but there's no button prompt, so we just leave the area and spend what feels like 20 minutes trying to figure out how to open the door, and honestly, it took so long that I actually stopped recording my game. We retraced all our steps, went into all the rooms, interacted with everything we could find, but just couldn't figure it out. And in the end, one of my friends suggested that we should hug the walls and see if anything shows up. We finally found what we needed using this technique. It's the same contraption that hooked the key to our hand. Reflecting on it, we should have guessed that we needed it for the control pad as it was similar to the previous one, but it was just so different enough for us to not really figure it out on our own. We then frustratingly make a walk back to the dispenser while getting some intense Silent Hill 4 vibes. We force its hands into it and the eternal screams echo when he abandons the halls as he bleeds in response. <laughs> not having learned his lesson, decides to keep following us after the abuse we just gave him. We walk it back to the front door and insert his hand into the machine. We go into the other console and finishing opening the colossal door. We look back and we realize what we've done. His hand is trapped in the console, so we freed him from one hell in order to leave him to die trapped in another. The worst part is that it's technically not the most humane option of the two. If we would have brought him to the chair with the scoop instead of the chair with the saw, the scoop would have decapitated him, leaving his hand on the chair. He would have died gruesomely, of course, but it would have been instant, as opposed to the elements until something takes his toll. That's also the moment when I realized what it was. It wasn't a living being, or at least it wasn't seen that way. It was seen more like a resource, creating a door switch that traps the user with no way of him getting out. The way that your character just picks him up like some piece of trash and forces him into the machine, and the way that the whole system is just made just reeks of class status. Previous bodies also lie on the floor dead to all the machine piling up with no sign of respect really depicts what this place is. Beings are processed in order to allow their other beings to accomplish what they needed to do. They are farmed, or to the very least, kept in a cage until they're summoned to do what their sole purpose is, offer their existence to whoever asks for it. You can easily make links with the real world here, as animal farming is often immoral and the use of slaves have marked our culture for centuries. We then cross the door and look back as the door closes behind us, leaving it to rot, abandoned and discarded as we venture on. 
It's some pretty strong stuff and as the beginning of our quest, it's an amazing start. It sets the tone for the game pretty well. It also gives us two ways to complete the task and we're left scarred for the rest of the game. Unfortunately, it all starts to fall from here. The branching option doesn't appear in the game again and we don't get another moment like what we just had with the creature in the subsequent chapters. There's a moment that does come close to it but I'm getting a little ahead of myself so let's move on. The rest of the game plays out the following way. We enter a new area and we start exploring the surroundings. We're lost in awe, and <laughs> often literally lost, uh, as we try to find anything for which we can interact with until we actually do. In this case, we found a switch that makes us control a floating machine that picks up these dick-shaped vials from the ground. We then float it into the opening and it gets filled with... whatever looks like diluted man juice. I mean, jeez, I'm not making this up. Like, that's literally what it looks like. Afterwards, we actually got lost again. We couldn't find anything else to interact with. We walk to the newly opened area and it's an instant dead end with nothing to interact with. There's indeed a beautiful view outside, but it only eases the frustration momentarily. We then walk all over the place again, passing through the same corridors who knows how many times, commenting on the art direction, the lack of player guidance. I also stop recording the game again and let my bro take over as I thought that a new perspective would benefit the search. Huh? And the same thing happens as before. It turns out that we needed to walk onto a specific platform which acts as a switch. Huh? It activates the pillar in front of it and that's when we get to pick up our first weapon in the game. You can extend your spear twice before it needs to cool down, which is represented by the white bar on the right side of the screen. Now, there's an issue which I need to address before we head forward. The graphics are the main reason why you should play this game, but they're also the main reason why the game is frustrating all the time. Everything looks the same with the same color palette that makes everything blend together, therefore camouflaging anything of importance. You feel like you're walking in circles most of the time, and it doesn't help that there are multiple paths that circle back, adding to the frustration. Also, as everything looks the same, you'll hardly figure out what you're supposed to do. Switches are hidden in plain sight, and are really hard to find in most cases. Although, to give credit where credit is due, once you know that the switch is there, you can see the effort that was made into making it visible. For example, the floor button is void of all other aspects, making it pop out of the environment, and the shape helps you somewhat figure it out. The same thing can be said with the hand upgrade in the previous area, with the added light source above it to make it pop. It's really a stroke of luck if you end up finding it, and then you feel like an idiot when you end up figuring it out, which just totally misses the point. Just to give you a more concrete example, later in the game, you'll be forced into some encounters and we kept dying because we were constantly low on health. We thought that it was ridiculous that we were halfway through the game and we didn't find a single health item. We went into the key bindings only to discover that there is indeed a healing item and that we were almost full of it. We just had to press the key. These kinds of moments happen often enough that if I wasn't playing it with friends and I didn't plan on making this video, I'm not sure if I would have finished it, honestly. That lack of explanation also applies to the storytelling and lack thereof. There is no dialogue in the game. There are also no collectibles to pick up or text to read. The whole game wants you to absorb the surroundings and theorize on it as I did in the previous area. That can be a bummer for some as we're not used to that kind of treatment for my modern games. It was more common in the past but never honestly in this scale. In other words, if you're not a player which analyzes the surroundings and gets this fun from it, then you're mostly just shit out of luck, huh? Mind you, there's nothing wrong with that, but I can't help but wonder why they had to go so imperial on it as they did. The worst part is that, as there are no story beats to stop the flow of the gameplay, there's also nothing to change the vibe of the game. There's also nothing to break the monotony of the whole experience, and once the graphics become stale and lose their charm, you're left to concentrate on the aspects of the game that just don't work, which again is isn't intended by the developer. Once we have the probing gun, we head back to the corridor and this time, we already know what to do. We saw a few interactive switches and penetrating them with the gun activates the machine. Once both switches have been boned, we head back to the main control booth, use the machine to pick up the other vials and use it to push them into the openings as we did previously. Once they're all in, we activate both switches and the machine breaks, leaking out its contents and covering our protagonist, making him pass out in the process.
We wake up again in an area, which reminds me of the H.P. Lovecraft movie called Color Out of Space. On a side note, I would totally recommend the movie, by the way, if you haven't seen it. And also just read the story too, because they're both actually pretty different, but they complement each other pretty well. So, if you get the chance, do check it out. It's pretty dope. Back in Scorn, we look down and see that he's been preserved the same way as the first body was. He unroots himself and falls down into the floor below. We then proceed to remove the umbilical cord, and that's <laughs> nasty shit. <laughs> Again, I just love the cinematography here. The macabre scene in the fog in the background is just amazing. We get up and look above and see the other barnacle pods on the wall. There's also this guy who died hanging on from his umbilical cord, which I actually find comedic somehow. I don't really know why, but I do. We turn around and walk in the long sea of corpses. Sand and bodies cover the area with some sort of flesh corruption embedded in the sand. What's also cool is that we can see some towers at the far end, which really pushes the sense of grandeur. I find that a lot of games have a hard time making you feel like the world existed before you arrived in the scene. It often feels forced or temporary, with little context beforehand but here it's impossible not to feel like you missed everything you're clearly there after some form of rapture happened and i wonder why did we wake up now of all things why is he in this world and why is he going through all of this further down the path we can see what looks like odst pods and some flesh substances coming out of them i wonder if a war happened here and only the leftovers were left intact the live tissue from the being has been consumed and turned into whatever that is at the bottom of the tower we can see an opening that leads inside. We follow the path and admire the gorgeous work that the devs have put into until we get to the other end. We look around some more until we find another corridor and, full disclosure, this is my favorite tunnel in the game. I just love how claustrophobic it feels with the simplistic pattern being repeated over and over again. It's at the far end, we see a monster blocking our path and we have no way of defending ourselves. We turn around but it's a dead end, so we move forward and see that it runs into an opening. We follow it and discover a barely lit room with what looks like eggs of some sorts. It looks like a ball of flesh with skeleton hands keeping it together. And the sounds of this room really get you immersed and creep you out at the same time. We follow the path and find the creature hanging from the ceiling like it was waiting for us somehow. We get closer and it leaves again. We enter the same room to find a central hub that looks like a gigantic mechanical heart. We follow the path to the left, only to discover a new challenge. There's a highlighted cylinder thing with another closed container right next to it. In front of it is a tower with four spheres that look like scrotum of sorts and, as their color pattern is different from the rest of the game, and the gigabajig in front of it is highlighted, we know that these controls will have to be activated somehow. We turn around and continue towards the left side, and this is actually pretty cool. They added a light over the door that pops up from the environment, so we know instinctively that we need to interact with it. Before we interact with the door, there's a skeleton on the floor which stands out from the rest. We interact with it and pull out what looks like a key with a cylinder contraption. Right next to him is an opening where we can insert the key. The puzzle here is actually pretty simple. Rotate the top needle until it's aligned with the opening on the ring below. Do this three times and bring it all back to finish the puzzle. Your reward for doing so is an added ring, which isn't clear for what it does yet. We look behind us and interact with the door, only to find out that it's locked. There's a symbol next to the door that has a highlighted sphere on its top left. We turn around and head back towards the control panel from before and insert the cylinder in its designated slot. The first egg falls in place before us and the left path unlocks allowing us to further explore the area. This is also where we realize that we've embarked on another fetch quest. As the scrotum, yes, I'm calling it that from now on, uh, went back into place, we know that we'll need to find the other three rings in order to synchronize their drop, unlocking our way forward somehow. We then enter the newly unlocked area and go up the elevator. We keep following the path until we enter the tunnel and we get to interact with another cool concept. By interacting with the control panel, we can select an opening and... It connects it together in a way which feels so satisfying. It's actually really cool and I just love how it doesn't seem fully robotic but flesh-like and well, 
It sort of makes you feel dirty using it. I'm not gonna lie. It's pretty cool. Also, have you seen there are multiple paths that you can take and all of them are necessary to complete for this quest. Huh? You'll essentially be walking all over the place to find the three rings that you need to proceed. So it can be very disorientating as coming back from a tunnel just messes with your perspective. This is also the moment where adding a visual clue or a mark somehow would have gone a long way. The end result is that you'll commit to a path and then find out that you looped and went back to the area. And as there aren't that many unique markers, it's hard to recognize where you were and where you're heading. To make matters worse, the egg room is also copied further down the path with a similar scrotum treating, so you'll often take a path and then realize that you messed up as your mind mixed both rooms. Also, in case I didn't make it clear by this point, there are no maps to speak of and no way to leave waypoints to find your way back. Huh? Although, to give credit where credit is due, it forces the player to use his instincts and his curiosity to travel and therefore unravel the mystery in a more natural way compared to other games. The flip side of that is, if it takes too long and it feels too grindy, people will give up and move on to greener pastures. At one point, we arrive at another control booth, but it has three red pipes that look like umbilical cords stuck inside of it. We remove them one by one, and the same white liquid pours out of it before disappearing into the ceiling. Do it for all three, and the fan in front of us stops, highlighting where we need to go next. We turn around and walk to the end of the room, where we get ambushed by the creature that was blocking our path earlier. Okay, this is actually another really cool thing. Remember that probe gun we had earlier? Well, we just got it again, but now we know its origin. It's the tail of whatever jumped us, which ultimately means that we were holding a dismembered body limb in the previous scene. It's pretty cool how the devs know how to play our expectations, as I've never seen another game that pulls something like this. Although, its intentions are still left to be seen, as it did rip our flesh open so that it could insert its hands in our abdomen. We press onwards and hope that a new alliance would be for the better, which judging by the world around us is actually pretty naive. Huh? I mean, there isn't a sliver of hope or kindness in this world, so why would I expect the best out of the creature currently abusing us? What are we getting in return? A probe tail? All we know, I could be using its dick as a weapon, so I would be doing it a bigger favor than it actually lets on. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of extending things that I don't understand, I find the next key component which is the same puzzle, but the sphere moves by itself this time. It seems hard at first glance, but the trick is actually in the sound cues. When you hear a click sound, you know where you need to place yourself and wait until you can do the same thing onwards. Afterwards, I get lost again. The way that the rooms connect and intertwine really make the whole area feel bigger than it actually is. Huh? At one point, you'll interact with another tunnel contraption and end up covering it with acid, unblocking a path and letting you instinctively know that you need to go there next. Huh? You'll also find another hidden blade key and finally, you'll finally get to the last puzzle. Half of the puzzle is blocked off, so your first instinct will be to freak out and question your existence. But if you remember the previous trick, which is about the sound cues, then you'll be mostly fine. Wait for it to appear and then just place yourself there and do the same thing over and over again until you're done. We then head back and insert a completed key into the machine. We follow it by view until it stops in place and we're greeted with the final puzzle of the area. The same thing as before, it looks intimidating but it's actually pretty simple as all you need to do is take the time to examine it. You basically just need to figure out where you need to go first, second and onward until all of them are switched on. Once that's done, we get to go and examine the open testicle to find a person stuck into it. We interact with the stand and pick up the remote looking thing that has the same symbol as the door we found earlier. There's also another item that we can pick up and, as we're doing so, an engineer-like dude comes out from the egg and dies in front of us. We walk back to the locked door and use the key which allows us to leave the area. Before we do so, I actually get a little worried. I examine the padlock to the door and a thought comes into my mind which is, 
There's no way that we'll have to upgrade the key multiple times in order to access a bunch of doors, adding to the length and repetitiveness while reliving the frustration every so often, right? I mean, it's not like the whole game was a full-on fletch quest, right? And this would totally make sense as there are multiple spheres that are dark? Nah. I hope not, at least. <laughs> While I'm at it, there's also another thing that I've realized, and it's that the levels were made with gameplay in mind, and not the lore. What I mean by that is, imagine the whole city before the apocalypse. There are crowds of people doing their stuff. Civilians of all ages are going around doing their thing like any other day, and all the machines are working as intended. You're telling me that the procedure of getting around the area is finding an intact key, walking around the whole hub, and upgrading it manually until you get a full set? I mean, sure, there would be guards or another way to stop randoms from getting access to it, but it's still a lot of work for no reason. It wouldn't be efficient in any way, and frankly, it would be a total waste of time. Plus, I actually got lucky. Someone filled each machine with exactly one ring before they died so that one person, which would be me, would be able to unlock it and leave the area. Not to mention that, we should have found multiple keys and not just one. Think about it. Wouldn't it have been more efficient if the station had multiple rings in their inventory so that the people who actually need it can grab it and proceed with their lives? I know that it may sound like I'm being picky here, but the thing is, the game is trying so hard to make you believe that it's a real, tangible world, right? Uh, where everyone died, society raptured, and you're there after everyone else, huh? And yet, their levels were not made with that idea in mind. It ultimately takes you out of the whole world building. It makes you remember that you're playing a video game. This concept is even more apparent in the next area, so let's just put a pin on it for now and move on. We head into the room and we get to interact with a cool contraption on the wall. We insert our item inside and it penetrates its anus, filling it with blood, which in return adds four orbs to its extremities. Now, you don't know this already, but this is actually our backpack. In their quest to make the hub non-existent, they found a way to integrate everything in game and give it a tangible purpose. You won't have an icon at the bottom of the screen explaining to you how many health packs you have left, uh, but have to manually pull it out and look at it. You can also look at the lower part of your body to see the creature on its back holding it, giving it a sense of immersion unlike most games. Even healing has its own animation which fits with the philosophy of the world. You have to insert it into your skin and let the blood rejuvenate you and bring you slowly back to life. Uh. It's a pretty good touch. The slight downside is that they weren't able to remove the hub entirely. We're still stuck with a health bar that disappears a few seconds after it's on screen. I wish they had tried harder to make it look more like Dead Space, where the health bar is displayed on the back of our character. I don't really know how it would make it work here in a first person game, but I think it would have been worth it to figure out a solution. Maybe your arm becomes bloodier and scratched the closer you get to death. Huh? Although, just to play the devil's advocate, Maybe they thought it would be too frustrating for the player, so they compromised. I don't know, but honestly, I'm still left wanting more regardless. The same paradox happens when you examine the ammo in the game. They also go into the remaining holes of the pouch, but when you use the gun, a bar on the right side appears, showing you how much ammo is loaded and how much you have stored. Now, I know what you're thinking. There's combat in this game? Only the second half of the game has combat, but before we get there, there's something that starts happening once we get up the lift. Huh? I don't understand why it does that, and it's pretty weird that our protagonist doesn't even grunt at the pain. I guess we'll have to push onwards for now. We go through another door that requires our remote control. We loop back to the starting area and things are drastically changed. The place is dustier, in ruin, more abandoned somehow, like time has passed since we awakened. We also can't see the entrance where we abandoned our friend, so he probably perished as we all do here. We start retracing our steps and everything is darker and grayer. Maybe the malfunction rendered this area obsolete. Huh? We get to the starting area and use our remote control to open the door. We go down the lift and activate it. I really love how they made the lift by the way. I just love how it looks like a spine that's holding the lift. Huh? Genius idea for real. We accidentally arrive at the fork on the road. We go left and fuck me. We already need a higher clearance for real. <sighs> Whatever. Let's go for it, I guess, huh? We walk back towards the path at the far right to find some creatures flying in the air. 
We turn around and go right once more to find our first upgrade for the remote key. It only adds one knot, so it's confirmed that we'll have to find multiple terminals like this in order to gain access. Full disclosure, only the last orb won't be upgraded in the end of the playthrough. I guess that they preferred the pattern with the orb rather than without. We use our key to unlock a new door, and we finally meet our first enemy in the game. Now, I want to deviate for a second and talk about the other artists that inspired this game. Interestingly enough, most of the interviews and discussions made on the game mention H.R. Geiger, but very few talk about the other famous artists that inspired the game. I actually wasn't even aware of him until I started doing some research, even though I've seen his art on multiple occasions. His name is... well, here's his name on the screen. <laughs> I have no idea how to pronounce his name, so I won't even try, but when you look at his art, you can instantly see the resemblance between his art and H.R. Geiger's. The key difference between both these artists are less about the psychedelic personification of man and more about creating what he calls the photography of dreams. He made some surreal paintings to which he doesn't name or explain what it represents, so they're all left to speculation. Here are some of my favorite ones that he's made, like the building here which has featured on a lot of art pieces throughout the years. When you compare this image with the other one on screen, you can see his mastery in color as both buildings have similar characteristics but have a total different feeling to them. The mastery of color in particular is what stands out to me, with its use on the different tints of orange to create haunting contrasts which stay with you even after you've moved on to other things. You can clearly see his influence in the opening cutscene, with the sandstorm camouflaging the ruins at the back of the scene. The deserted corpse wasteland is another one where his influence is seen, and the way that the buildings are represented really creates that same level of tension and curiosity that his art creates in the viewer. If you want to learn more about this artist, I recommend that you watch the video that Blind Dweller made on him. I'll leave it in the comment section below. But the reason I'm mentioning him here now and not earlier in the video is because I know him for a painting that you'll see on screen. When I look at the creature before us, I can't help but make a connection here. Something about the proportions and the way that it moves really seem familiar to me. Its twisted figure is also complemented by its attack pattern. It shoots balls of acids towards the player, removing a huge chunk of health on each successful hit. It's revolting to see say the least, and that's the main feeling that I get when I look at his paintings. Interestingly enough, Wyszynski would often state that people misunderstood his paintings without explaining what he meant, so it is entirely possible that I'm missing the point of his art as well. Regardless, I like it, and I'm happy that I took the time to research him for this video. In order to kill the aggressor, we'll need to hit it five times with the probe gun, and unfortunately, we can only activate it twice before having to wait for the cooldown. That means that attacking it consecutively isn't a good idea as it leaves us open to attacks. The cool thing is that we can use the gun to cancel his attacks and to shove it on the side making it essentially a speedrunning tool. By the way, if you do decide to attack it till death and you aim perfectly at the head during the final blow, you'll get a cool animation of the gun being shoved into its head killing it on impact. With that all said, we'll avoid it and activate the switch to make the door rotate which also breaks the cable attaching to it. Examining it up close, we realize that the cable is actually a centipede of the same creature forming a line of sorts. Looking around the room, we can see that they're literally everywhere corrupting everything in its path and rendering everything obsolete. We then lined both rotation doors to open the path upstairs. Once complete, we avoid the creature and head towards the exit. That's when we're introduced to the second enemy of the game. They attack us in a similar fashion, with the key difference being that they're faster and rarely miss us. These are really annoying as they often attack you before you get the chance, so you'll practically always get hit first. They have a really long range and they are rarely alone. Thankfully, they only take two hits to die and, similar as the first one, you have a special animation on the second hit. We go back upstairs through the tunnel and enter the new room where you'll be able to interact with a new switch. We activate it and the lift moves in place. The creature in our back attacks us again, removing a bar of health and we press onwards. We use the lift to get to the other side and interact with the switch. The elevator is held in place, so trying to remove it results in it breaking the lift. This is where the second worst part of the game starts as, in order to fix the elevator, you'll have to complete a bunch of puzzles, avoid even more enemies, and get lost in the process. 
I swear, the second time I played through this part, it took me even longer because I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record at this point, but most paths look identical. They did try to fix that by adding corruption in a way that looks different if you stop and take the time to examine everything. But the issue is that by the time you get to this part, you'll essentially be playing on cruise control. Completing fetch quest after fetch quest does that to you, as all you want to do is get rid of it as fast as possible. You'll be trying to speed run through it in order to find the next set of keys, uh, puzzles and switches, and here, it's even worse. Uh. In order to fix the elevator, you need to get to the ground floor in order to call a new elevator. In order to do so, you need to liberate the path for all three floors, which means that you have to run to one end, complete the puzzle, kill some creatures, run to the other end, insert the key, and do it all over again. By the way, the lift that you use in order to get lower isn't controlled by you and moves on an invisible timer. That means they will often move between the floors regardless if you unlock them or not and it won't wait for you to get in. You'll often get to the lift and the door closes in front of you, forcing you to wait for it to get down to the last floor and then back up again. The worst part is that, I don't know if it's my lack of luck or what, but the lift would often go down when I'm about to get in. So I end up waiting a lot for it all the time, which adds to the feeling that you're wasting your time. Additionally, what's also aggravating is that you may actually start dying from here on out as enemies will often swarm you and body block you. You might also not have enough ammo, so you may have to resort to the probe gun, which is far from ideal. Ammo and health packs are scarce and you will end up lacking if you're not careful. Add in the mediocre save system and the fact that you'll have to repeat some gameplay guaranteed and you have the perfect example for how not to make your level design. This level also makes another issue rise up which is that all switches look identical and it's hard to understand what they do. You'll interact with so many switches that you forget which is which and waste a lot of time redoing it. You also can't cancel or speedrun the animation so you're committed to the very end which just adds to the length and frustration. The thing is is that when you take all of these annoyances separately, they actually aren't that bad. It's when all you do has a caveat that you really start to feel it and certainly does weigh on the experience. To top it all off, I also don't like the unique puzzle in this area. You need to interact with the spheres on the wall and move them around until they're all lit up. Sounds simple, and it certainly is. There's no trick involved like the last one, forcing you to understand the puzzle and predict the moves. You'll therefore be turning them around and trying to figure out what the logic is behind the movement in order to get it all to work. The issue here is less about the puzzle and more about the state of the gamer by the time he gets to it. You'll be in a hurry wanting to move on to the next part and having a puzzle that stops you in place for a long time just breaks the flow of the game. Also, when I say a long time, I do sort of mean it as I don't know why, but I would always do one of the two pretty fast and then get frustrated on the second one. It also doesn't help to alleviate the feeling when all of your rewards are the keys required to progress, which in this case are the lower floors. On the positive side, you'll be able to grab your first gun upgrade in this area. It's a gun that shoots like a pistol of sorts and is useful at taking care of the enemies from afar. The downside to this gun is that it's obvious that it isn't strong and reloading takes so fucking long. Like, look at this reload, look how long it takes and imagine doing that while you're being shot at at the same time. Plus, imagine having to do that multiple times in a span of two hours. There's also a turret enemy which I haven't mentioned yet and it looks like a black worm thing which hangs from the ceiling. Once you end up on the ground floor, you can finally summon the new lift and then retrace your steps to bring it back to the starting area in order to get it to the other side of the wall. Now, before we move on, I just want to reiterate my previous complaint which was that the map layout doesn't feel believable. Imagine if the lift broke and this place was brimming with life, do you see anyone having to fetch multiple keys to go down and then remove the lift from another area just to replace a damaged one? It's practically ludicrous. Huh? Who would hide the key behind the puzzle like this anyway? It's just weird and I find that it removes you from the immersion and feels really gamey in the world which is trying its hardest to immerse you. Plus, to top it all off, the wow factor is practically gone at this point. You've seen all there is to it and adding those creatures and corruption does indeed change it a little, but not as nearly as it should have. The reason for this is actually pretty simple. They might have changed how the world looks, but now how you traverse it. In other words, Corruption or not, it doesn't affect you, and therefore you simply don't care in the end. You'll sprint through the corridors faster than your digestive system after ODing on spicy food because your goal as a player hasn't really evolved in any meaningful way. You'll immediately look for the nearest switch, activate it, and run towards the next nearest switch. Combat is shit, so you'll avoid it when possible in order to do so, and ironically enough, you'll get frustrated and lost because of all of this. In other words, your game can be the most beautiful thing in the world, but it's a story that will get you invested in the game. The music will immerse you in it, and the gameplay will ground you in it and make you actually live it. As this game doesn't have voice acting, 
barely any music to speak of, and add in the repetitiveness and unimaginative gameplay and you end up with a pretty boring game overall. Which is sad because the game is extremely memorable at the beginning of the game and it is heart shattering. The middle part feels like a poor execution of a Ubisoft title and the end part brings it all back surprisingly enough and it is actually my favorite part of the game. Huh? Thankfully for us, we're almost two thirds done so let's just speed run through the next part so that we can get to what actually made the game good in the first place. Just before we get to the left, uh, we get attacked by the creature in our back once more. <laughs> We have a short segment where we have to interact with a few switches in order to move some walls out of the way in order to get access to the exit. This is also where we meet the last enemy type in the game. It's a bull-like creature which charges towards us when we get near it. If he does a direct hit, we'll lose a ton of health, usually killing us, so we should avoid it at all costs to keep our health up. If we also get unlucky, he can stun lock us like in Sonic 06 killing you before corrections can be made as his animations are faster than ours. He's also bullet sponge so the best way to take care of him is just to circle around him like a boss and never stop walking. You'll also have to get another upgrade for the remote key in order to move to the next section where you'll have to cross a long pathway full of enemies. Interestingly enough, if you go left here and keep at it, you'll reach a dead end to get swarmed by enemies, killing you guaranteed. Oh yeah, this game has a lot of dead ends as well. I didn't really mention it before because they were all non-consequential, but this one, if you actually go left, it is the only part where you'll get swarmed and you'll die instantly and the end path is completely blocked off so there's nothing that you can do except die and then restart and go right which is honestly a pretty shitty move to do so once we get to the end of the proper path we'll go and interact with a switch and the devs finally do something amazing Look at it! It's amazing! Its scale is unlike anything that we've seen in the game so far. As it's conscious of the pain that we're causing him, it hits similar strings as the creature from the beginning. If we examine him closer, we can see that his size covers the whole central area and that, by activating the switch, we can now access the area under him. On his back, there are also what looks like worms, or maybe enemies on the map, wiggling on its back trying to get out. It looks like some sort of sentient hive, blocking our path, therefore acting as a natural blockade in our quest, uh, while being a visual spectacle for the player. What's also impressive is the fact that his mere existence changes the way we perceive the layout. Even if all the past problems that I mentioned persist and plague the gameplay, activating the final switch and hearing it growl in pain while his body shreds into pieces makes me really feel something. Our guilt is then multiplied as it's turning its head just to stare at us even if it doesn't have a pair of eyes. It has no mouth and yet it wants to scream. That sickly look guilt trips me every time making it feel like the best fetch quest map of the game. Speaking of fetch quest, the goal here is to open all three paths in order to go under him and activate the pillars in order to assemble all pieces for the final puzzle. You'll be swarmed all the way, get lost as usual, get pissed off that you can't jump down the path and need to go around just to get access to the desired area and more of the same usual stuff. Huh? You'll also find the shotgun upgrade which consists of the final gun upgrade for the game. Well, sort of. but. Whatever, we'll get there when we get there. You'll also have to upgrade your remote key again to unlock more of the area. On a totally separate note, once we're inside the beast and go towards the main puzzle, we'll get attacked by the creature on our back. But this time, it makes more roots grow out of our body, infiltrating all muscles and organs. And it will only get worse from here. Finally, once you get all three towers to the rightful place, uh, you have to complete a maze-like puzzle with the goal being that you need to get the red orb to its center. All three maze layouts combine to make the total maze so you just have to position the orb and then rotate the puzzle in order to move it some more. It's pretty basic stuff so it also highlights the inequal difficulty of the puzzles overall. This is the last puzzle of the game and it's a cakewalk compared to the previous one but at this point I just don't care anymore. Once the puzzle is done, the room activates and we discover that it's actually a lift and it goes high. Really high. And then, once you get close to the top, this happens.
The spilling of guts liberates the path upward and we get to leave the area. We get to also look through the window to see the creature in pure agony. There really isn't any salvation for anyone or anything in this game. There's only death and suffering. We look through the other window to see the persisting sandstorm. We then walk to the end of the path and before we enter the control booth, we're seized by the parasite once more. <laughs> We activate the switch and head towards the unknown in the most beautiful trainway that I've ever seen. I just love how the devs are able to make something that we find mundane, bland and standard and turn it into something extravagant. Some might even say magical. It really makes you curious about what lies ahead. Wow. What a beautiful change of scenery. There's something really beautiful about the way that the colors changed and the mist slowly vanishes to showcase what looks like a majestic place, huh? But of course, they just wanted to tease us a little and build tension. That was just the devs flexing their art and getting us slowly excited for the final area of the game. We finally arrive and immediately we get a sense that this area is dedicated to H.R. Geiger and him alone. We can see a beautiful sexualized statue of a woman at the far end of the wall. Ruin and abandonment doesn't diminish her beauty, but somehow adds to it. The perforated walls help frame her and give her a grandeur otherwise unseen in most other games. It makes us feel like we're discovering the rooms of a long abandoned society and that their dedication to their craft is only rivaled by their imagination. The newborn archaeologist in me goes up the stairs and bows down to the beauty stimulating me. People often say that an image is worth a thousand words, and I strongly believe that it is implied here. Everything that I see in this area, I am blown away by it and impressed beyond my wildest dreams as the music straightens and adds to the complexity of it all. Ruins of other statues lie on the floor, the union of heads making a central column. There's this sense of godhood and legacy in the way that these statues stand tall, even now as it all has gone to ruin and decay. It really forces that idea of insignificance on whoever dares gaze on its splendor. There's this ecstatic thrill of finally getting out of the dark and secluded into the bright, open and royal. You see, this is why I said that the last area was the best part of the game. You still haven't seen the interior and yet I'm sure that you're just as speechless as I am. We enter the long hallway and look at the purple webs which contrast with the varied shades of grey. I might even go as far as stating that it gives this room somewhat of a psychedelic vibe for the whole experience. It appears endless and dreamlike compared to the macabre feel of the room and the irony is that once you know what its source is, it immediately clicks into place. They're made for the brains of the past travelers creating what looks like a network of some sorts. By the way, they're also open in the chest area which is somehow reminiscent of the Hellraiser and other Clive Barker creatures. Behind this, there's this beautiful mural on the wall with the message as cryptic of the game itself. At the front of it all, guarding the room and welcoming all guests is one of the coolest statues that I've ever seen. I hope that someone makes a replica of it at some point and contacts me lets me know so I can buy a copy. <laughs> I really want one in my collection because it looks so fucking cool. We then go down the stairs and up the second pair of steps uh, to see two bodies lying on the platform. The body on the left has a long tube in front of it from which we can retract a vial. We leave the area and head inside the tunnel and this is where my praises for this area practically stop. We arrive at the door and insert the vial in the contraption next to it. The mechanism activates pushing the door towards the right, allowing us to access the sealed off area. We turn right and grab some ammo, health and the container on the pedestal. We can see that a disfigured creature resides in it and I think it's actually pretty cool. It's definitely unsettling and pretty unique. The devs really know how to present their stuff. <laughs> We bring it to the other end of the room to find a biomechanical body with a similar shaped opening on its torso. We insert it inside and it starts coming to life. We shoot it and the creature comes out, killing the other shell and whatever resided in the glass box. We pick up the corpse, bring it to the entrance and insert it into the machine.
Removing the vial resets the door, so we go back and insert the vial inside the same machine that we grabbed it from originally. Now we need to do the same thing for the second one, so we grab the empty canister and walk back to the door. We insert the vial once more, and looking at the new body, we can see that this new version has a weapon on its right arm and a robotic arm for the left. Anyone who's played a video game before can guess that a battle will follow suit, so my question is, why can't I just kill the creature inside the canister when it's on the pillar and skip the whole encounter? Why do I need to put it inside the robotic body in order to kill it? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, imagine if the society that created this building was still alive and they had to design a system like this. I'm sure that risking their lives every time that they needed to feel a vial wouldn't be part of their plans. It would have been cool if the game programmed both options. For those that didn't think about it, they would be forced into the boss battle, and for those that did, like I did on my first try, get to skip it. But nope, that's just not how it was imagined. So I insert the class prison and get ready for the inevitable battle, and oh my god, is it bad. So, here are the first 30 seconds of the battle, unedited in any shape or form, just to prove my point. So, here you go. Wasn't that exciting? The boss only has two attacks. He shoots his grenade launcher in one direction, but only when it senses you. And sometimes, if you get lucky, he will try to dash hit you, therefore using his second attack. That's it. No superpowers, different phases, and transformations, or anything else that you can imagine. The worst part is that you can keep looping him around the structure until the end of time. He doesn't know how to stop in his tracks and change directions. My question then is, why even add a pillar to go around if you know that you've programmed your AI that way? To make it even worse, there are two of these pillars in the room, which means that it was intentionally put there because they want the player to play this way. It would have been a lot better if we just didn't have it and let the player dodge the bullets by walking in a constant diagonal. It still wouldn't be a good boss battle, but at least it would stimulate the player and not have him play Ring Around the Rosy game for like the eternity of time. We keep turning in circles until he needs to reload his grenade launcher. It's only during this very specific moment that you can hit the purple blob on its side, making him take damage, shooting at anywhere else at any other moment will not cause damage in any way. You know what's even worse? If you go to the end of the room and interact with the health and or ammo dispenser, the boss will just wait patiently until you're done. I know that this game has a lot of combat design issues, and I've already mentioned them countless times, but it's hard not to feel like something extra should have been done if you're going to force me in a one versus one battle. Crazy still, after you've broken both purple bags, you're left with the worst part of it all. You have to wait for it to deplete its ammo, get close to it so it stops following you, and then hope to god that it lets you shoot its weak spot. More often than not, it will hold the protector screen while reloading, so there's nothing that you can do but repeat the process and hope that you have an opening on the next run. This phase can be as long, if not longer than the first phase, really damaging your last impressions of the game. I want to know who designed this and said it was fine, like, I play a lot of bad games on purpose, and I've seen some very badly designed stuff, but this is just another level. Also, if you thought that my first time was an exception and that I got unlucky, you would actually be wrong. I finished this game four times and every time I was like, the same thing. Honestly, it's very disappointing overall and I would have done without it, so imagine my relief when it was finally killed. We grab the grenade launcher on the thing before heading towards the entrance. We juice it again and it only feels the vial halfway. Uh, fuck me, I have to redo this again? Uh, okay, whatever, fine. It's the last one. Let's go do it. We walk back and the thing attacks us again, but this time it's actually game changing. I can't change my weapons anymore. I can still heal myself and reload, but 
that's about it. Luckily for us, the grenade launcher is the weapon we need for the next part. So it's pretty convenient that we grabbed it on time and we're still holding it when it fused with our arm. The other container is kept behind a blocked door. So I stand on the button on the floor and shoot inside the opening. I grab the container and yep, we're gonna have to kill this asshole again. But, and this is a huge but, the battle is extremely simple. We go around the wall again until it decides that it needs to reload. Shoot it inside the casket and look at it explodes on its back. Now remember when I said that we got sort of all the weapons when we grabbed the shotgun before? Well, the grenade launcher is strictly used for puzzles from now on. And the only combat moment that we ever use it for was this. And honestly, I'm happy that it's the case. Huh? Because with a boss battle like this, I am done with combat. Period. <laughs> We grab the corpse and juice it again. The vial is now full, so we take it and walk back only to get attacked again. Now our left hand is useless, so we can't reload our gun or even insert the vial in the stand like it's trying to sabotage us or something. We can still heal ourselves as is done by the creature, so it's definitely hypocritical. What follows next is pretty ingenious. As we can no longer interact with the switches, doors and everything else alike, we can use a new machine on the wall specifically designed for this exact situation. We now have a limited time before the roots grow back on our hand, so we'll have to complete a few basic puzzles like shooting the gun while avoiding obstacles, upgrading our remote key for the final time, interacting with all the switches while losing health in a constant rate, you know, your typical stuff. Huh? It's honestly really cool and original which shows that the game is at its strongest when it's trying to be as immersive as possible and lets you concentrate on the world building. We rapidly go through all the obstacles until we get to the end of the room and interact with the big machine. Wow. Just look at it. It is amazing. What I find very interesting is that it seems human at its core. It has also the same figure from the main menu and from which we start the game as. That means that the visions that we were seeing at the beginning were from two different entities and not two different moments lit by the same character as I initially taught. Once we're done observing it, we can now aim the machine at its head and activate it. <laughs> Fuck, that's rough. If we look down, we can see that the intestines are almost falling off. We also just lost our weapons, so let's hope that we don't need to use it anymore. On the side note, I also want to show you my favorite view of the game before we move on, so please disregard the gun. I just love the composition of this scene. Walls guiding the view of the statue while giving us a sense of depth. Particles leaving the top of the walls while the mist gives it that dreamy vibe that I just love so much. It's just amazing and I never get tired of seeing it. We leave the room and limp towards the right side in order to activate the switch. We exit and examine the statue up close and realize that it works similarly to the testicle statue. Containers containing humanoids are located at its feet and the pregnant stomach contains the blood of their awakening. As this area doesn't have any red corruption, I believe that this was the original design and implementation of the machine. We then go up the same path and retrace our steps. Huh? We go down the stairs and insert the vial in the other two. Platform goes up and then we push ourselves to the chair next to it. What follows next is pretty cool indeed.
we wake up, but the perspective is actually different. We can see the red sphere located on the abdomen, so it seems that we're now in the possession of one of the pregnant bodies. We get up and walk to the surgery table. We get close to the robot and interact with it in order to pick up its blade and our previous body. By examining the body, it seems pretty similar to the corpses that we found in the desert. It doesn't have a mouth, and the shape of its head is similar. It also makes sense as we did wake up in one of the pods, and there were many of them scattered on the walls. I think that this is what the mural represented, as we had to connect our body to the machine in order to get access to the body on the right. I just haven't really figured out what the middle part means. In case you were wondering, I'm not controlling the knife. It moves by itself, and I have no say in the matter. We then switch to the other body and walk towards the key dispenser on the wall. Note that this is the only time where blood isn't spilled during the process. That makes me believe that it's some form of mechanical being and the stomach is its life source, confirming my hypothesis about the pregnant statue. Now, before we continue, look at how cool they both look, huh? especially the new body that's holding us. It looks so muscular and yet mechanical-like, with that little like flower opening thing on its forehead really giving me some Last of Us vibes. Huh? And the back, oh my god, I just love the skull. It looks so damn cool. We then get to the main switch and activate it and look at the mural. It's so imposing. The colors are vibrant, making it stand from the rest, including the brain webs. I also believe that this mural represents exactly that. The process of opening the brain in order to connect it to the whole system we see before us. Once the switch has been activated, we then transfer our consciousness back to the previous body and walk slowly towards the switch on the floor. We press it and wait for it to finish opening the exit. We then walk slowly towards the other end, which brings us to the final cutscene of the game. Here's the unedited clip of me finishing the game. Please enjoy, and afterwards we're gonna circle back and explain what the story is. Or at least <laughs> I'll do my best to attempt it.
And that's the end of the game. If you feel disappointed by it, don't feel too bad because you're not the only one. I've shown this game to four other people and they all basically felt the same way and they stated that it was a complete letdown and honestly I do understand why. It's hard to accept that everything was for nothing but I would like to state the opposite which means that I'll have to attempt to explain the story. To be brutally honest with you, I still don't understand parts of the story even after finishing it four times so I may have misunderstood or straight up glossed over some important stuff. Huh? This game is also left interpretation of the player so how I see stuff won't necessarily match with yours so I'll excuse myself in advance for anything that I get wrong. I also didn't watch other people's videos because I wanted to challenge myself and try to develop my detective instincts. Nevertheless, I would still recommend that you listen to what I have to say and use it to build your own opinion on what happened. My goal is to encourage you to think and reflect on the whole experience, so I hope that my analysis will be a good starting point for you to dissect and make your own theories. With all that said, let's get started. So before we start talking about Scorn, I would like to talk about the Engineers and Alien, or more specifically, the Prometheus movie. I know that the director mentioned that the game isn't based on aliens, but there are some parallels that I can't deny between the two, and I think that it will help explain the story of Scorn. He did also say that the average length of the game was around 8 to 10 hours, and it's actually closer to 5, mine actually being even lower than that, so I would take anything he says with a grain of salt, so to speak. In Aliens, mankind was presumably created by a race nicknamed the Engineers because, well, they engineered mankind. They were so advanced as a race that they had the power of creating life as well as causing its extinction. One way they could cause said extinction was to introduce into the ecosystem a substance called chemical A0-3959X.91-15. Black goo and the pathogen are also its alternative names and it's believed that they created it but no proof was found for, to sustain that idea. Its use is pretty straightforward, creating life by deforming the cells of the hosts and, more often than not, to destroy the organism. It essentially merges with the organism and either kills it or mutates it, creating offsprings like notably the xenomorphs. That chemical, when released somewhere, kills anything it touches as well as anything that breeds its spores. In other words, it can mix its DNA pattern with the host and if it doesn't kill it or it survives long enough, it can breed an entirely new life form. In the movie Prometheus, the planet that they land on was presumably a storage for the goo and an outbreak killed almost everything on it. Lastly, the movie starts with an engineer voluntarily swallowing the black substance and is rumored that his suicide act is what created mankind. I know that's a little random for me to bring this up in a game that it's not based on the alien universe, but I promise it will make sense later on and it's actually pretty important. Also, there's obviously way more to this universe than I'm mentioning and explaining everything would be bigger than the scope of this video, so I'll stop here and get back to Scorn. The origin of the city was unknown, but it was clearly thriving and rich in both culture and technology. It was a booming area where the rich could have great control over the weak and the subclasses. They idolized their gods and wanted to beat them, to surpass them by ultimately creating and modifying life. They were adding non-organic to organic, splicing themselves off, trying to create the next best thing, and that led to their version of the black goo. I think that there are two types of them, being the white liquid in the system and the red stuff that we see everywhere. I believe that the red stuff corrupts the host DNA and creates a biological weapon fit for weaponizing and use of force. All of their weapon stashes were made with these interactions, which is why we find a bunch of weapons scattered all over the place and subsequently acts like an add-on to ours. That means that they have enough of these to keep the society rolling, so imagine how many of these must have existed in order for them to keep their supplies up and running. It's also then not hard to realize the issue would arise and they ended up with some form of outbreak that sends them spiraling out of control. Section of the district were quarantined and people started dying rapidly, either from attacks or by other means like starvation and lack of an energy source. Plus, I suspect that the elevators were shut down as well, so normal citizens ended up trapped with no place to go. Others were also dying above, but the main headquarters were sealed off from the rest and were safe from it all. Fearing the worst, they fulfilled the prophecy and went through the portal, saving the important people. The small 2%, so to speak. I also have the feeling that they might have released it on purpose, or kept a bunch of them around because it's the only place we can find the surgical table exists. Not to mention that the hand shredding machine was also conveniently available, so maybe they were using them as some form of rite of passage. I'm not entirely sure, but it is indeed fishy. 
Years have passed since then and has everything died? So did the attackers. They do need a source of food or to the very least a host. Uh, so they also disappear in oblivion and that's when both entities wake up. The parasite awaits for our arrival, awaiting its destiny so to speak. We proceed through the hubs with the goal of going above and entering the cathedral. They probably all knew they had to get there and I'll explain why I believe so in a few minutes. We see a bunch of corpses everywhere with all of it being very intact. We find ourselves in a plane that was quarantined, left to decay with time so nothing got to the bodies. They simply just died of natural causes. But what I find interesting is the concentration of bodies in one area. Logically, it should be an exit, maybe another one of those lifts and if so, they all died because it wasn't operational. So just to recap, we find a lot of bodies because nothing really got to it and time turned them all into dust. That all changed when the machine malfunctioned. You see, this is where my Prometheus theory comes in. I believe that when we died in the white liquid, our body was used as a vessel to birth what I call in the game the corruption. This white stuff is the main pipeline of the building and connected to everything and anything. The release of that big of a quantity mixed in with our bodies and the other bodies of other victims could have mutated them, been used as food for the liquid and in return turn the corpses into a new living organism. It probably also got mixed in with the red stuff creating something new and prosperous. That means that when we removed the umbilical cord we were actually playing another character and that the first one died birding a new generation of monsters. Another reason why I believe it's the case is because the red roots really don't appear until we walk into the desert like area which happens after our first life cycle. When we examine it up close it doesn't seem to be moving like later in the game so it's possible that it drived up from the lack of food and resources. It also appears more concentrated as we get closer to the entrance, which is where we meet the parasite. Interestingly enough, there isn't that much corruption here, and most of it is still intact, so we probably had a hard time getting into this area. There also aren't that many corpses there, so maybe it just wasn't abundant enough for this area and wasn't accessible to most people? The situation is different later on as once we leave this specific area, we get back into the starter area which is also clean. Unlocking the previous blocked door leads to the formation of one of the hives. No bodies can be found and the red tissue can be found literally everywhere. It fused with the corpses and created a new life form that attacks us on sight. It also makes sense when you realize that the game takes us to big places like an important elevator intersection and the main exit to the tunnel. Those are areas that would have compared to a transportation center or a busy street nowadays. Also note that these new spawns don't have the weapons we'd used, meaning that they definitely came from a parasite on our back. The corruption also becomes more intense the closer you get to the hive monster, which I believe is the main elevator out of there. I think that this monster was created from the accumulation of bodies in one area and were reborn in a single entity and I believe that there is one simple reason for this. If you knew that there was an outbreak in the floors below and that letting even one of them above could cause death and destruction, is this such a far fetched to believe that the people in charge would choose to deactivate the lift so that no one can join them? The markmanship on the statues, murals and the impeccable architecture work leads me to believe that the high classes would have either resided there or would have been working there. Wouldn't it make more sense if they would have let everyone below die thinking that their lives would be more important and therefore worth preserving? Whichever reason motivates them, they still did exactly exactly that so a big concentration of people showed up creating a bottleneck. Corpses piled up in one area and mixed in with the corruption and the white liquid brought the creation of the beast we see before us. It keeps birding other living creatures and is also the same color as the white liquid so chances are pretty big. That's why we need to complete the weird puzzle to get it running and why we needed to remove the key to get access to the other areas. In retrospect, doors created by quarantines of sorts. The protagonist, thinking that the lift is the only exit, decides to try his luck and get to the lift. As nothing is really there to keep him from activating the lift, he succeeds and leaves the area. Once above, he starts the ritual and is able to remove the parasite as this is the only area that he has the necessary machine. He then transfers his consciousness which is represented by the change of perspective and the main wall mural. It makes us believe that he succeeded as his soul will survive and I think that this is where the other mural comes into play. I'm still not sure what it means but maybe it represents what happens in the end. His soul is connected to the brain network and his body is offered as a sacrifice to the creature. If we believe that the middle part represents what I just mentioned, he was either lied to, thinking it would lead to freedom, or he knew it and hoped that he would be able to survive as a consciousness. Either way, it backfires as our view comes back to the protagonist and ends up failing his quest. Huh? Know that the creature completely ignores the being holding us, so it's probably not alive, therefore not attracted by it. In the end, I like to see the ending as if he was deemed unworthy to his 
ascension. His consciousness wasn't accepted into the system as the expressionless body stopped before the portal, therefore refusing to save him from Daffa. Suffering, cruelty and death is all we did and no positive acts were made which reflects his world as a whole. It's only fitting that the game ends battling as well and for two reasons. If we had a good ending, then wouldn't it not match the tone and the ideologies of the game? Secondly, the word scorn means, and I quote, the feeling of belief that someone or something is worthless or despicable. Everything in the game fits this concept. We start the game in the dirt and ruins of time. We treat the creature aggressively and return his kindness with pain and death. Bodies pile around us with no care whatsoever. We're abused by the creature and our will is not considered in any way. Everything around us also seems so big and demanding that we seem insignificant next to it all. All interactions our character has leaves him emotionless. He doesn't care if he has to rip you open, dismember you, or kill you as long as he gets what he wants. Ultimately, even the prophecies saw him unworthy and left him to die without even trying to save him as if he saw a piece of paper floating in the wind. It's a very pessimistic way of seeing things, but it also fits the global themes nonetheless. I think that the way the devs wanted to communicate this idea is with the fusion of the bodies at the very end of the scene. Both entities, which start the game separated and alone, fuse together, creating a new connected entity which shouldn't be able to exist in any way, but it does. It's dysfunctional and disgusting, but beautiful in its own way as it acts like a warning to whoever shows up next while being a spectacle for the eyes. It is a perversion of the mind and soul. And those are my thoughts on the game. I doubt that I got most of it right, but I hope that you found it entertaining nonetheless. Huh? Now comes the final part of this video, which is, would I recommend it to you? And my answer is yes. I see Scorn like a very dysfunctional museum. It has some awesome ideas, it looks amazing, but the layout is intimidating, badly designed, and walking hurts your feet. <laughs> You're happy that you went in, but it will be a while before you decide to go back. Huh? I would also recommend that you play it just to support the devs as they clearly wanted to make something unique and different which is becoming exceedingly rare nowadays. It's an experience and one that I've never seen before or felt before other than when I played Agony. Although, Scorn is a lot more wholesome and thought provocative than Agony. We could have had a bunch of genitals all over the place, a bunch of gore and so many other psychedelic scenes, but the game knows when it's appropriate to use them and when it's not, unlike Agony which is an orgy fest of all of the above. I do still like Agony, but Scorn is easier to like and appreciate even with all its missteps. That doesn't mean that you should run and get it though. I think that everyone will perceive the value of the experience differently, but personally, I don't think that it's worth paying in full price. I got it at a discount before launch and I'm honestly happy with it. I also showed it to four of my friends, had a cool time, and loved it enough to pre-order the art book. And that's good enough for me. With that said, I want to thank you all for watching the video till the very end. It took me a long time to make it and research. So like and subscribe if you want to see more and if you actually want to support this game or get closer to his dream. Huh? Do let me know what you think about the story in the comments below as I'm very curious to hear from you and see what your take is on the matter. I hope that I'll be able to entertain you again in the near future and with that, I'll see you on the next dissecting table. Bye now.